Who here likes having birthdays? Show of hands, who's a bit of a birthday fan? Fantastic. That's actually all right. It's probably about 40%. So I will say this. Birthdays are fun up until you're north of 25. Then they just start to get sad. And then when you're knocking on the doors of 30, the last thing you want to do is celebrate your birthday because it's like, oh, my gosh, I'm getting way old. But I'm not quite there yet. But I remember when I was younger, when I was a wee little spring chicken, old enough to be in kids' life, still in primary school, I had this birthday party. Now, when I say birthday party, let me just paint a picture for you. It was mum, it was dad, it was my sister, it was my grandma and my grandpa. So we're talking about a raging party. And um, this, this one particular birthday, I got to have KFC for dinner. Now, I know, right? Now, when you're in a small country town, KFC is a big deal. It's still a big deal as an adult. I still enjoy KFC. Upsets my tummy a little more than it did when I was little. But, you know, we got to have KFC and every year for our birthdays, ever since like Emily, my sister and I could remember, dad would make us like these extravagant cakes. Does anyone else have someone in their family like mom or dad or an uncle or auntie that just goes bonkers with the cakes? Well, my dad, for some reason, loves making birthday cakes. And so he would make like big ballerinas. He made like a big dump truck pouring lollies out, caterpillars. One year he made me a water ski cake because I like water skiing. I know, right? The guy's crazy. But the funny thing was, this one birthday, all I wanted for my birthday was a Coles mud cake. You know, like they're kind of like the staple mud cakes. We'll get one on the screen. Now that right there. Yeah. 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 I mean, seriously, if you have not experienced a Coles or a Woolies, I'm biased towards Coles, but they both taste very sugary. If you have not tried one of those delights, I would encourage you on the way home from youth, go via Pack Fair because that one's open late. Get yourself one of these cakes and just enjoy just an experience eating this cake. But anyways, all I wanted was this cake for my birthday, you know, like... and. When you get fixated on something as a kid, you kind of get fixated there, you know? Like I had this idea, I was dropping hints about my presents, you know, I knew what I wanted for my birthday, I knew that if I got the right amount of money that I could get this thing and I dropped like a thousand hints, I want a Coles mud cake, you know? Grandma and grandpa come around, they give me the birthday card, the staple 25 bucks and you're like, yes, it's amazing. I still love getting $25, I feel like the older I get, the more value that money has. But so I was like 25 bucks, I was all excited, I was happy. I was like, this party's amazing, like it's good, I had KFC, I'm happy. And you know, like I was waiting for the cake. Like I was waiting for this Coles mud cake that I dropped hints about. Dad was a little sad that I got a Coles, I wanted a Coles, Coles mud cake, but that's all right. Didn't stop me, I was determined. The table gets cleared and I'm like, all right, we're ready to sing happy birthday to Jason. Like this is my moment, I'm ready to go for my Coles mud cake. And I'm sitting there, just sitting there. And then mum and dad go, oh, we we didn't have time to get you Cole's mud cake. So I know, hang on, it's all right, it's okay. So I did what any 11-year-old boy would do. I burst into tears and I hid under the table. Started crying, I spat the dummy, and I was crying under the table. Now mum and dad, I think were uh, probably not thinking that that was the response I was going to have because they were joking. So there's a happy ending to this story. I did get my Coles mud cake. So mum and dad walk back out and they're like, no, 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 we got you a Coles mud cake. I'm like, I'm not crying. Like, you know, I'm fighting back the tears. I'm like, you were crying. I was looking for money under the table. Like, shut up. (laughs) Coles mud cake. And, you know, like I was fighting back tears. I definitely did cry. It was very embarrassing. It was so weird. I cried over a cake. Anyways, I haven't quite processed that one. (laughs) But, you know, so I got my Coles mud cake. I was happy again. But but I thought, like, as we're talking about joy, I thought tonight I just help us understand that I feel like sometimes when we think about joy, we get a little bit confused um, with, with happiness. And I think happiness is a really, really good thing. But so often when we talk about happiness, it's based on these types of moments. Like, I literally went from being on cloud nine thinking I was going to buy myself this cool remote control car for 25 bucks. Next minute, I'm under the table, bawling my eyes out because I didn't get a Coles mud cake. Then I'm happy again. I'm fighting back happy tears. You know, like, it's this sort of like, it's, happiness can sometimes be a bit bipolar. Like, we kind of just feel like in and out in an instant, things, things are happy and then things are sad. It's like, no birthday cake, you know, you start crying. That's rightly so. You know, someone compliments you. Someone says, hey, you look good today. All of a sudden you're like, yeah, I feel happy right now. You know, if someone came up to you and said, hey, mate, you got a face like a twisted gum boot, you'd be like, wow, thank you so much for that. 
That would not make you feel good. Also, never ever tell someone that. That's not an endearing comment. You know, when your footy team wins, you're happy until they lose. Just think about this. When we talk about happiness, happiness is so often based on something that is out of our control. Our happiness is dependent on things from the out, like from outside. Often that's the case. You know, your favorite song gets played here at youth, so it's like, I am happy. You know, that song that we've played three weeks in a row, and you're like, oh my gosh, get a new song. It's like, I am sad. As I say, happiness is something that can come and go in a minute. It can be a little bit bipolar. It's a little bit up and down. It's $25 in your hand and you are happy as. Then the next minute you're not getting a mud cake and you're sad. Now our understanding of happiness can be very, very turbulent. I think for Christians and non-Christians, all of us in the room, all of us right here on planet Earth right now, I think that when we think about joy and happiness, we get confused. But I actually think we, we only really know how to hover in the happiness zone. Now, there's nothing wrong with being happy. I have to specify that. I love being happy. I love Cole's Mud Cakes. They still make me happy. I love KFC. It makes me happy. You know, there's things in my life that make me happy. So I'm not saying that happiness is a bad thing. But I believe, I believe that the, the pursuit of happiness that we have, that there's something below that, that our desire to be happy, this temporary moment, I believe that if we can scratch down the surface a bit further, go from happiness, I think that that's when we begin to find joy. And joy is just that next level down. It's that depth in which it's kind of like we don't feel as swayed. It's like life doesn't feel so turbulent and so like all over the place. It just seems like joy is this thing where it almost seems a little more stable. There's a quote by a band called Ren Collective and they say this, happiness is smiling when the sun's out and joy is dancing in the downpour. I love that. So happiness is smiling when the sun's out. So when things are swinging in your favor, it's good. That's happiness. But joy is dancing in the downpour. So when that sun's not shining, how do we respond? In all of life, how do we respond? You know, there's a couple in our church called John and Ellen Morris. Has anyone ever met the Morrises, John and Ellen? Fantastic. So they're like a half American, half Norwegian, half Australian. I realize that's thirds. Good maths, Jason. So we'll go thirds of all of those. They kind of have like this beautiful, confusing accent. You're kind of like, I don't know what it is, but it's really cool. I want to learn it. But the the Morris family are a family who I think understand joy in a way that I'm like, that's captivating. You see, when I go around to the Morris's house, they kind of have a bit of an open door policy. You can kind of just go around there and enjoy your feed with the family. If you want to know where the address is, let me know afterwards. No, don't actually. That would freak them out. They would actually probably love it. That's the worst thing. They're so happy, right? They're so filled with joy. And you go around there and they have three little kids and like, you know, you're just a part of everything that goes on in their house. You know, when things are going well, when the kids are enjoying your company and it's all just happiness and joy, it's good. But then in those moments where things aren't so good in the Morris household, you know, when kids get sick and kids get grumpy, John and Alan are still filled with this joy. You know, sometimes when family stuff's going down with the Morrises, They're just filled with joy. There's something there that I'm like, I think they understand this quote, that um, happiness is smiling when the sun's out, but joy is dancing in the downpour. I think the Morris family have understood dancing in the downpour. And if you ever see them around the courtyard, trust me, you cannot miss them. They're like, they're just a bundle of joy, both of them. It's great. But I think we need to ask ourselves the the question, like, why, why do they live and feel that way? So when we think about people, when we think about happiness being this level, but then we look at joy, it's something being a little deeper. Something being a little deeper. This whole series has been about going deeper. It's been about us looking at what the world says. This whole idea of us winning at life. The whole idea of us winning at life, it's not actually about us. It's about what Jesus has done. I think the Morrises understand that so beautifully. I just think there is a joy in their household. There's a joy in the Lord. They know who their creator is. They understand God's grace. They understand the love, the love that I preached about a few weeks ago when I said love is not about whether you do or don't get a rose, but it's about the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. John and Ellen understand that. They understand what it means for them to be forgiven by the sins they have committed and the ones that they will commit. 
They understand the grace of God. And because of that, there's just a joy outpouring in them. There's something that just, ah, it just captures you when you're around them. Through God's grace and what Jesus did on the cross, the Morrises are no longer searching for happiness. They've found a well of joy. And my hope and my prayer is that tonight, throughout this series, as we wrap up this win series, my hope and my prayer is that we can all find a source of joy. We can all be reminded of the things in our life that are going to bring us joy, that are going to fill us with joy. We as Christians, our souls, those of us who don't yet know Jesus, those of you, I shouldn't use inclusive language there, those of you who don't know Jesus, whoops, there's something that our soul is longing for, something below the depths of happiness. Happiness is a good thing, but it comes and goes in a moment. But joy, if we can grasp the concept of joy, if we can understand what it means, then there's something that our soul has been craving and we can find it. And our life can be changed because of it. We need to learn how to dance in the rain. We as Christians, we need to learn how to dance in the rain. Smile at the sunshine, but then learn how to dance in the rain. You know, Paul, Paul, who's just a very, uh, very influential person in the Christian faith, uh, he wrote a lot of the uh, New Testament. In Romans, he writes this in Romans 5, 1 to 2. He writes this. He writes, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us into a place of undeserved privilege where we now stand and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing in God's glory. Just, just think about that for a second. Because of our faith, because of us responding to the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, because of us responding to you know what I've preached about the last three weeks, because of us responding to that, we now live a life of undeserved privilege. Just let that sink in. For the rest of your life here on earth and eternity, you are going to live a life of undeserved privilege. That's the message of grace, that we don't deserve it, but we get it anyway. Because of this, because of this undeserved privilege, we can look confidently and joyfully, that key word, joyfully, Look forward to sharing in God's glory. So what does this look like? What does it mean for us as Christians living in, in, in you know, 2020? I nearly said 2021 then. Oh my gosh, I fast forwarded a year. In the year 2020, what does that look like for us? It means in all things. In all things we find joy. We don't try and feel temporary happiness. And once again, happiness is fine. It's good, but happiness will run out. It changes like that. It's one minute we're celebrating $25 in a birthday card, the next minute we're crying over a cake. But when we actually learn to understand joy, there's something deeper about that. It's us learning to understand, to find joy in things. It means that when we can see God's hand at work in our life, whether it be the smallest thing, whether, you know, we've been praying for an opportunity, whether we've been praying, hey, God, I pray that, you know, you, someone ask me about faith. I pray that you give me the courage to share my faith. Whether, you know, we see God's hand at work in that moment, it's us responding in joy and going, God, thank you. I can see you working in my life. You know, when we pray, what we see is the most simplistic and basic prayers. The prayers that we're like, I would never pray that out loud because it seems so simple. When we see God answer those prayers, often not in the ways that we want it, but when we see God answer those prayers, we respond in joy, in gratitude, because we have a peace that God is with us, that God hears the cries of our heart. God hears even the most simplistic prayers. It means that when we're anxious in a moment, when we're tense, when we're, not, when we're just not feeling great, and we just feel the peace of God, maybe in the smallest way, but in that moment, we respond with joy. When we feel God's calming hand over our life, we respond with joy, not with fake happiness, but with joy. It means that if things aren't going well, now we have to listen, so I have to be careful how I say this. We rejoice in the midst of our suffering, but not in our suffering. 
So it's really important. So I'm going to say that again. We rejoice in the midst of our suffering, but not in our suffering. So when I say that, I mean we don't go around being like, yeah, I'm happy, like suffering, yeah. We don't do that. I mean, go nuts if you want to. I don't think that's what, that's, that's not what God wants. But God wants us to rejoice in those moments when things get hard. God wants us to rejoice that we know that God is with us. That even in those hard, heavy, dense times, God might actually be doing something. So we rejoice in the midst of our suffering, but not in our suffering. It's really important that we just understand that. You know, Paul goes on to talk about this. He goes on to talk about a little bit about the suffering. In those moments where it's kind of like, oh, I don't know how this is going to go. How should we respond? And we read on from, verse, from chapter 3. It says this, We can rejoice too when we run into problems and trials. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. Read this next line. And this will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us, because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with love. And then when we read on in verse 11, I haven't got it up there, but it says this, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship. So Paul's saying, once we understand our relationship with God, then we need to turn and we need to rejoice. We need to find this joy in this peace and the hope that we have in the gospel. He says, so now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. Jesus Christ made us friends of God. I think that's such a beautiful thing. That's something, honestly, if we're Christians, that's something that we need to be filled with joy about. Joy does not mean a fake smile. Joy doesn't mean every day we can't be sad. (laughs) Joy doesn't mean we don't cry even when it's a mud cake. (laughs) You know, joy doesn't mean that we ignorantly run through our life going, I'm happy, 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 happy. Everything's fine. Everything's roses. Nothing ever goes wrong. Oh, I'm happy. Oh. Joy means instead of us banking on happiness, we remember whose we are and what he did for us on the cross. So that's what joy means. Joy means instead of banking on happiness, we remember whose we are and what he did for us on the cross. It means that we embrace happiness when it comes our way. (laughs) When happiness comes our way, it means that we embrace it with open arms, but we don't let it control our life. That's the trick with happiness. As I say, it comes and goes in a moment, and so often it can be so determined on what's happening around us. Happiness when it comes is great, but we can't let it be the thing that controls our life. There needs to be a deeper source. We need to dig deeper. We need to find our identity, our sense of joy in something deeper than material, simple, happy little go easy things. We need to find a joy in the gospel. And those of us who are Christians right now, we should just be just doing cartwheels in our heart because we're reminded of what Jesus Christ did on the cross for us. We've been reminded for the last three weeks what it means to win at life, what it looks like to win at life. And it means that Jesus already won it for us. And now we just get to celebrate with him. We just get to enjoy the fruits of Jesus' labor. It means that we cling on to hope in the gospel when we feel like we've got nothing else to cling on to. That's what joy looks like. Joy isn't simply a smile. Joy is is an attitude our soul has. It means that when life's tough, we don't ignorantly go, well, life's going well. (laughs) In those moments of heaviness and hardness, it means we acknowledge it, but we find comfort in what God is doing. We find comfort in that God is right there with us. That's, That's where our joy should come from. You know, Rick Warren, who's a pastor over in America, he's one of the big pastors over in America, huge church over there. He's someone who honestly, he has every right to be a sour, sour person. Life has not always been easy for Rick Warren. He's had some really, really hard times, but Rick Warren just has this beautiful quote around joy. And he says this, Joy is the settled assurance that God is in control of all the details of my life. 
the quiet confidence that ultimately everything is going to be all right. And it's the determined choice to praise God in every situation. I love that. From someone who's had his fair share of suffering, that's someone who understands what joy looks like. It's acknowledging that God is in every situation. We rejoice because God is right there with us. That in those moments where we just feel like life is heavy and things aren't going our way, that as Paul says in in God's Word, in the Bible, Paul says that in those moments we are to rejoice in our suffering, we're to rejoice in our hardship because it's building something in us. It's building endurance. It's helping develop our character. And it's giving us an even stronger, even stronger faith in our salvation. So these things that in life that may not seem like they're going well, they're actually helping us go a little bit deeper in our faith. You know, for me, a, real, a really real example of what joy in not a great time looks like was last year my uncle passed away really, really suddenly passed away really suddenly and honestly in a way that surprised all of us. It was really, really hard on our family. And I remember going down for the funeral and then coming back to youth (laughs) and knowing that that night at youth when I got back up onto the Gold Coast, we were actually doing a panel on mental health. And I remember just thinking there is no way after what's been going on in our family the last week, there's no way that I can do this. I just remember thinking, like, it just, it almost seems cruel. But it was interesting because that night, you know, there's emotions going on in my heart and I'm, I'm wrestling with my own stuff. And then I remember jumping up and, and I just felt this peace of God and I just I had this moment where I felt like God was teaching me so much about listening. You know, I'm someone who will just, I'll talk and I'll just kind of get distracted, but I remember that night, God just clearly teaching me the power of words. God teaching me the power of listening to questions, of listening to the cries of the hearts of people. I remember that night, God just gave, God opened up my heart in such a beautiful and pastoral way. So that night, I didn't get up there declaring everything was all honky-dory. In fact, if you were here, you probably would have remembered at the start, I was, a little, I was a little shaky. But I just remember going through this. God's actually doing something in me, in this suffering. That's what, that's what joy was in that moment. It wasn't me laughing. It wasn't me being happy. It wasn't me you know, getting happy over a $25 note or whatever it was. It was about me going, I'm, I'm rejoicing because in this hard time in my life, this hard time in my family's life, God is teaching me so much. You know, there's a song that we used to sing years and years and years ago, and the line was, break my heart for what breaks yours. And you know, when all of that happened, I felt like I really got a glimpse into God's heart for some stuff that night. And so I think, I think when we think about happiness, we actually can't come to that moment. When we think about happiness, it almost seems crude and sick to think of that. When we think about joy, when we think about rejoicing in what the Father is doing, there's something that that disarms us. There's something in those moments that when life is just heavy, it's hard, that even in those moments we're reminded of what Jesus did on the cross for us. We're reminded of the love of the Father. We're reminded that in these moments of just heaviness, that God is right there sitting with us. That God is giving us a giant big bear hug, telling us he loves us. I'm sure if God could give hugs, he would give big bear hugs. I'm convinced. It probably says it in the Bible somewhere, I don't know. I don't think it does, but we won't tell him. I love that quote by Rent Collective. Happiness is smiling when the sun's out. Joy is dancing in the downpour. And I feel like we as Christians, we actually need to do a bit of dancing in the downpour. 
this whole series has been, as I said, it's been about how can we win at life? How can I win at life? And the answer is, well, on your own, it's going to be a struggle. (laughs) But if we respond to the love of Jesus Christ, if we begin to understand what grace is, if we learn to forgive even minutely on the level that Jesus forgave us, then our world, our world is naturally going to become filled with more and more joy. Not happiness, maybe dribs and drabs of happiness, but there's going to be an overwhelming sense of joy. So I promise, as I promised the last couple of weeks, I promise that if we let it, if we let it, joy will win in our life. I promise that if we're reminded for the rest of our life what Jesus did on the cross, if we're reminded of that moment that we said, yes, I want Jesus Christ to be my Lord and my Savior, I promise joy will win. It will be hard. Like I say, there's times when it is just hard. It's not fun. But in those moments, God doesn't feel distant. God feels right there. And that's where I seek my joy from. Let's pray. God, firstly, I just thank you for happiness. God, I thank you that in, in just the everyday things, God, there's, there's things that you put in our world to just give us just a taste, just a sample of what real joy might look like. But God, I want to pray. God, I pray that tonight we grasp the concept of what joy is. God, I pray that we are people that are known for the grace that we show one another. For the grace that we show the people in the schoolyard. God, I pray that we are known for people who don't define love by whether we do or we don't get a rose. But God, we we define love by the sacrifice that you displayed on the cross through Jesus. God, I pray that we as a youth ministry, that we are always reminded of the, the incredible forgiveness that you offer us. God, if we were to commit the same sin every single day for the rest of our life, what Jesus did on the cross is going to cover that. And God, I pray that we never, ever forget that. And Lord, I pray that because of what we've learned over the last four weeks, God, I pray that our our understanding of joy is challenged. God, I pray that in those moments when it just feels a bit hard, God, I pray that your presence is made known in such a a way that we cannot ignore. God, I ultimately pray that, God, we just get it. Lord, that we get that you, you love us. And God, I pray that our lives are transformed. Lord, as it says on our church, as we walk in, more people, more like Jesus. God, I pray through the Christians in this room that we just begin to see this auditorium fill up with more and more people longing for the truth, longing for love, longing for grace, longing for joy, not satisfied with happiness, but longing for joy. Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us. We really hope that you love this message. If you have any prayer requests, all our details are in the description below. So please feel free to like and comment anything that you were particularly encouraged by. Also, share this video with anyone that you think needs to hear this message and make sure you click on the bell. 